Dragons are unbelievably powerful monsters that have the power to shape entire nations. Through our last couple of videos, you've gotten to see the impact this behemoth can have if simply left to their own devices. Entire cities could be destroyed in a matter of hours. The ecosystem of a whole nation could be shaped and reformed. Plus, further, entirely new magical spells could be created through them that could change the way we even view magic. As a dragon, there is no limit to the destiny you hold in this world. Anything and everything is up for grabs. Some dragons, of course, use this opportunity to enrich themselves, to burn and conquer, but others use this power for good. The question then becomes, if a single evil dragon could potentially destroy a whole nation, then could a single good dragon do the opposite? Today we're going to talk about Sundarasilum, known as the Laughing Worm, a dragon at the very cusp of restructuring all of society in the north. However, before we get into it, if you guys have somehow missed it, I have a Kickstarter currently running right now for a full 5th edition adventure for characters level 1 to level 11. We only have 11 days left, so if you have been postponing your purchase, it is now or never. And keep in mind that this is the only way you're ever going to get a physical copy of Monster Classes. If you guys like my Monster Classes series where you get to play creatures like dragons, ogres, vampires, or lycanthropes as full 5th edition classes, then know that we have an add-on on the Kickstarter where you can purchase all of my nine monster classes in a single beautiful soft cover book. Plus, exclusive to the Kickstarter, this version of my monster classes comes with one extra subclass for each monster class. Every single monsters class is getting a new subclass. Plus, I'm gonna let you all vote on what that subclass is going to be. Uh, do you want me to make a steel dragon subclass like our girl Sundar Asylum here? Or maybe you want to see a fang dragon? Uh, setting up for the Kickstarter and choosing either a pledge option that has the monster classes softcover book or adding it as an add-on will let you vote on this again these extra subclasses are exclusive to the kickstarter and this is also going to be the only way to get a soft cover version for these monster classes so get yours while you can separate from that we're also making a monster classes book that is themed to our sense of doom campaign it'll include the null the earth elemental and the troll as full fifth edition playable classes as these classes get completed, I'll be sending the playtest material through the Kickstarter so that you guys can uh, try them out earlier as well. Click the link in the description and check out my Sands of Doom Kickstarter. If you want to get any of the Monster Classes books, do note that you must first select a pledge tier before you can pick any add-on. But get yourself these Monster Classes books and I promise you that you will love them. Now, on to the video. First of all, Sundarasilum is a steel dragon, and this of course is extremely important for understanding its personality and why it does what it does. First of all, it's likely that you may have never even heard of this type of dragon before. Many people in fact confuse them with silver dragons and copper dragons. See, they are not just rare, but they basically also dedicate their entire existence to avoid ever being seen as a dragon. If you're interested in what steel dragons are, and how they function, I highly recommend watching my uh, What They Don't Tell You About Steel Dragons video where we cover absolutely everything you need to understand about them. But the main point to know about them is steel dragons practice what normal dragons like to call going human. When a dragon goes human, it basically means that it has decided to fully live life as a human. I don't mean just pretending to be a human, but actually becoming one. You know, starting as a kid, going to school, growing up, getting a normal, boring job, getting a family, like literally experiencing life as if you were not a dragon. It's very rare for a dragon to go human since not many willingly sacrifice their powerful destinies to instead become a farmer in the middle of nowhere, but steel dragons are notorious for this particular practice. Uh, Sundarisilum has chosen to live her life in Neverwinter as a seamstress. And she has a normal shop where she makes dresses and gowns for the ladies of the city. And as part of her business, she works also with one of the most popular uh, fest halls in the city, one called Moonstone Mask. So a fest hall is like an adult entertainment center. It, it functions like a bar combined with a casino, uh, combined with a brothel, combined with a spa. It's like an exotic club for adult 
adult-themed entertainment, and uh, Sundar Isilim sort of works as their official seamstress for all of their really sexy dresses that the ladies use. That being said, the dragon does partake in the uh, female activities of the fest hall every once in a while. In particular, when one of the courtesans gets sick. Uh, Sundar Isilim tends to shapeshift herself to look like the lady in order for her to take her place for the day. Uh, she does this as a personal favor to the matron who owns the Moonstone Mask, a sorceress named Ophala, who is one of the few individuals in the city who knows the true nature of the dragon. Uh, both are really good friends friends though, and they help each other out whenever they need it. She's of course important for the special type of work our steel dragon does, but we will cover that in a bit. Anyhow, the human form that Sundar Asilim has taken is that of a plump, curvy, stooping lady with white streaks in her hair. Uh, here's actually the official picture that we have of her, so uh, from the outset she basically just looks like a very nice innocent lady, but underneath lies a river of secrets and a network of operatives who strive to change the very foundation of the world around us. See, her simple seamstress business is merely a front, one designed to hide how she actually makes her money and all the activities that she runs in the shadows. In secret, she runs a small guild called the Soft Claws, who do her bidding, an organization of about 60 members who work relatively independently in order to bring the desires of Sundar Silim to fruition. See, our dragon here has a dream a destiny that she's trying to fulfill. She hopes that one day, dragons and humans can live together in peace and harmony for them to effectively become one in society. Just how dwarves and humans and halflings and gnomes can live together in sync in the same city, she wishes that so dragons could do the same. There are of course many hurdles in such a vision. For one, humanoids are ever so tasty to dragons, but even if a dragon were to swear off eating humanoids, which to be fair is quite easy to do for metallics, you still have to contend with the legendary hunger of a dragon. A hunger which which would be impossible to quench in a traditional humanoid society. It is very easy for a dragon to simply eat a couple of dozen horses while living alone in a forest somewhere, but if you had a couple hundred dragons living in a city like Neverwinter, feeding each of them hundreds of cows a year would cripple the food supply for the humans. This is a huge issue that has to be dealt with if dragons are to live alongside humans. Another big issue are, of course, evil dragons. Evil dragons do not fit the vision that Sundar Asylum has for the future of the land. In fact, if anything, they would work against it. For so long as there are dragons out there who destroy human cities and eat those humans, it'll be very difficult for the common man to not fear dragons. This actually combines with the greatest two threats that civilization has within the land, according to Sundar Asylum. One is the harsh temperature of the land. Uh, this place, after all, is called the Savage North. The cold is quite rough and limits a lot of what can be done in the area, but frankly, uh, there is just not much that Sundar Asylum can do about this. The other big threat, on the other hand, are orcs. Orcs are fecund. They are extremely fertile and highly aggressive and destructive. And the real problem with orcs is the cyclical nature of their attacks. Orcs have plenty of space to live in their mountains, but they always end up overreproducing to the point of causing a shortage of food and space, which inevitably results in hordes which come down from the mountains in order to invade the lands to the south. The hordes are always eliminated, but not before they bring untold destruction to every settlement in the way. So now, presented with all these issues, the great steel dragon Sundar Asylum got to work. She created the Soft Claws Secret Guild and started using the Moonstone Mask Fest Hall as a hidden meeting ground for the operation. Now, the guild itself has multiple objectives, all of which seek to solve the problems that I have just presented. And so, they actually do multiple things. 
Uh, by far the biggest and most dangerous set of operations has to do with the relocation of evil dragons. The guild effectively attempts to convince dragons to settle their lairs in very specific locations. Uh, locations which are either dangerously close to orc warrens or locations which would be on the way of potential orc hordes who would seek to conquer the south. They do this, of course, through misdirection. They manipulate dragons into moving by planting fake maps that suggest that there is a lot of treasure to be found in these dangerous locales. Or by literally creating really comfortable layers on these mountains and then tricking dragons into finding them. I mean, whatever they have to do in order to get dragons to move onto these locations. And of course, the hope is for those evil dragons to inevitably end up fighting the orcs. If the dragon slays all the orcs, well, great. No orcs to worry about. If the orcs kill the dragon, eh, that's great too, because now the soft claws can promote that to other dragons, saying something like, hey, we heard that a dragon died in this area, and I bet they had a big treasure pile. This can incentivize other evil dragons to go and steal that lair, and of course, then become challenged by the orcs once again. And at the same time, you're killing evil dragons, so that also works out. And even in the scenario where neither side kills each other, you now have a evil dragon who is too busy dealing with orcs to do any harm anywhere else. And you have a tribe of orcs who are too worried about the dragon in their footsteps to be doing any pillaging outside of their territory. Overall, a win-win. This is very dangerous though, because dragons are very smart creatures and most often than not, they do realize that they are being played. Though of course, by then, it is typically already too late. By the time a dragon sets up on a lair and gets their loot there, it is a big pain in the ass for that dragon to move that loot somewhere else. But yeah, when dragons figure out that they are being played, they do tend to find out who played them in order to kill them. But in this regard, at least, the soft laws do not have to worry about the orcs. Orcs are generally too stupid to realize what is going on and they will simply focus on the big dragon that they now have to deal with. Now, throughout her research on orcs and how to figure out ways in which she could deal with them, Sundar Silim came up with a huge idea. See, orcs eat a very interesting fungus and it is effectively this fungus what allows orcs to exist in the way they do. Quote, the edible fungi that makes the cavern-dwelling orcs so energetic, fertile, and hardy is a brown, fissured, rather fussy textured yet crunchy substance that grows in even the coldest, dampest caverns. It needs no light, but it flourishes when light is present and expands at a riotous rate in the presence of volcanic or other heat. Found growing in striations or parallel horizontal ridges on rock walls, it is called Arantim by the dwarves and, thanks to its appearance, ripple bark to humans, though it isn't bark at all. This not flavored woody fungus spreads by means of spores. These spores are harmless to humans when inhaled or ingested. They simply pass through the body like other wastes and can thus be carried as humans travel. The spores can consume living or dead wood, plant material, other fungi, and even airborne nutrients from mists. Ripple bark can lay dormant for long periods of drought, extreme cold, or lack of nutrition. To remain alive, it needs to feed only about every eight years. Scorched or dead ripple bark turns black, but it is still edible, and it alters disease germs as it absorbs them, rendering them harmless. Orcs thrive on this unexciting but abundant fare. End quote. So if you were wondering how so many orcs can exist in the mountains and caves, this is how. This is what you would call a miraculous food. Uh, Sundar Asilim studied this fungus for years, trying to figure out if there was ever a way in which you could create a strain that could be useful for dragons, you know, as a way to allow dragons to have a source of food they could consume that did not hurt the humans, and she actually found it. 
So what she did is she created a type of soak. It is an iridescent syrup of sorts made of mostly water but a fair amount of elixir of vitality. Then it is combined with dissolved air sports which is a common magic item that allows people to breathe air even in locations that don't have it. It also has the sap of oak or ash trees. It has dissolved pearls and at least a dozen more ingredients some of which appear to be the powdered bones of some animal. The members of the soft Claws actually have no idea what the full list of ingredients are since Sundari Ceiling simply asks for them to bring a bunch of stuff and then they bring that stuff to her but these are the main ingredients that are known to them. And so anyways this special liquid this soak is created and then Sundari Ceiling soaks the ripple bark fungus into it for months and what comes out is what she now calls long bite. The formal elvish name for this is Rothduin but that's not the name. The streets have given to the product. Quote, her process renders the ripple bark able to sustain all but the most terribly wounded or most active dragons for months on a small meal. Most active includes those rare dragons who spend a third of their time fighting or hunting. Small in this case means a volume of long bite roughly equivalent to the bodies of three average sized humans, end quote. So about 400 to 500 pounds of this specially soaked fungus can sustain any dragon of basically any size and age for months without the need for any more food. That is absolutely huge and absolutely necessary if dragons are to coexist with humans peacefully. Uh, this particular recipe, however, is still kept secret by the steel dragon because she knows that many dragons would literally kill to know it. Hunting for food is a terrible risk for many dragons and so being able to withstand not eating for months it would be a boon highly sought after by these creatures, but even good dragons would do whatever it takes to get something like this. Uh, for many of the silver and copper dragons that live in humanoid cities in disguise, the worst part is always when they have to break their disguises in order to go out to hunt. That always puts them at risk and it is a constant problem that they have to solve. In a way, you can consider Sundarasilim to be something of a master alchemist, especially since this is not the only great achievement that she has discovered. Her current work is a healing elixir especially designed for dragons. See, uh, the thing about dragons is that they heal very, very slowly. Do keep in mind that the game mechanics of a long rest is, well, that. A, a game mechanic designed to speed up play. But the reality, of course, is that if you, as a human, were to break a bone, it would take you a long time to heal it. Most fractures, in reality, take about two months to fully heal, and some, like a leg fracture can take up to five months to heal. This, of course, also would apply to dragons. Dragons can kill hordes of orcs in a single protracted battle, but if it takes them five months before that dragon can go at it again, well, that puts the cities of the north in grave danger, especially if dragons are meant to help these kingdoms survive against their greatest threat. So the elixir is called the soft scale soak and it has multiple uses. It keeps dragon scales supple, it sharpens the mind and the senses of the dragon, and can even slow down the negative physical side effects of aging and most importantly, allowing for a complete regeneration of sorely wounded dragons. The special liquid, which looks fairly similar to the one used for the long bite, so an iridescent syrup, is pulled into a big vat that is then used as a form of bath for the dragon. Uh, the current iteration appears to do all of its advertised effects, except for the rapid healing. It does heal, but not quite as fast as she needs it to. Quote, at least once, Sundarasilim has plunged into the heart of an orc horde in the mountain vales and deliberately lingered in battle until badly wounded. She was then snatched back to a disused quarry near Conniberry by the spells of a Fala Shelterstorn and lowered into a bath of her own preparation. Uh, most of these soaks fail to do more than soothe her, but the Laughing Worm still believes a successful sovereign healing bath for dragons is possible, if she can just hit upon the right formula for it." End quote. 
Oh, and Sundar Asylum is called the Laughing Worm because combat excites her so much that she constantly shuckles and hoots when fighting. Even in her human form, she's known as the Laughing Laundress of Neverwinter because of her upbeat attitude and, of course, uh, constant laughter. Though those nicknames were earned separately and no one has actually uh, made the connection between the two. Quote, Sundar Asylum likes adventurers, though she's wary of large mercenary companies and secretive organizations, is wary of unfamiliar wizards, and dislikes blusterers and tyrants, whether they be children lording it over their fellows in alleys, or kings who mistreat their subjects or try to conquer new territory. She often seeks out drunken, brawling, or bullying sailors who have come to port, or haughty or overly cruel visiting adventurer mages and teaches them a lesson. She usually lures them into private places by posing as flirtatious tavern wench, then changes to dragon form with clashing jaws and wild laughter. And usually Sundar Asylum lets those she has terrified flee unscathed, but she has been known to tear a mage's staff, cloak, and garments away to remove his magic, or break a sailor's sword arm and the sword with it." End quote. As Sundar Asylum is a good-hearted dragon with a dream. She thinks that for her vision of the world to come true, dragons must see civilization as a collective treasure that they should all protect, rather than vying for individual hordes that they can claim. And she is getting there. Her creations are miraculous, concoctions that can and will change the world, and helping her do it are her little army of soft claws. Uh, the racing her soft claws have been so successful at their job, getting her all the necessary ingredients, relocating troublesome dragons, and spying on orcs, is not just thanks to her mothering good demeanor, which turns out to be quite effective as a leadership strategy, but it's also thanks to the trove of specially made magical items that she gives to all of her crew. Uh, Sundar Asylum has access to what is called a Never Token. A Never Token, in terms of power, is honestly close to a legendary item, and she has hundreds of these. So these were like insignias or, or emblems that were created by Halruan noble families. So uh, this land right here is called Halrua. Uh, we don't really deal much with them in 5th edition for the most part. I think the only time that they have been mentioned is in Tomb of Annihilation. If you guys remember, there was that uh, flying ship that collapsed onto the jungles of Cholt. That ship was Halruan. But in any case, so back in the day, there was a splinter group of Netherese wizards uh, from the Netherese Empire who didn't really care much for all of the magical greed that the Empire was fomenting. And so, uh, long before the fall of the Empire, they left and simply formed their own cities in here. So if you can imagine, these guys were extraordinarily powerful archmages who knew a lot about magic, and well, uh, traditionally they created these tokens that would sort of serve as emblems of stature within noble families. So if a person carried one of these tokens, you, you knew that they were a noble, and you knew from which house they belonged to. Uh, these tokens were then very much magical and had all manners of spells engraved in them. Spells which a user could use freely if only they knew of the magic. Now, these tokens are so freaking powerful, it's actually unreal. Because again, this magic just doesn't exist anymore. This is ancient Netherese magic. You can't do that stuff anymore. A lot of these magic items were created using spells of 10th level or higher, uh, not that dissimilar from elvish high magic. And again, each of these tokens is basically equal to a legendary item. Now, one of these families was saved by Sundar Asylum, and she sort of dedicated about 30 years of her life to protect the remainder of what was left of this once honorable, powerful Halruan family. When the last member of the family died, they gave the dragon, well, a lot of money, but also uh, all of the tokens that they had. Quote, All of Sundar Asylum's Never Tokens appear as identical, glossy, smooth, silvery blue, four-pointed metal stars. Each is one inch thick and about four inches across from point to point. They are lighter than their volume suggests, pierced in the center to allow a neck chain or keep strike to be passed through them, and their points and edges are rolled and blunt. Now, they are constructed of an unknown alloy that is extremely durable and resistant to damage. In fact, it is hard to mark a Never Token with anything short of a forge hammer. 
When broken, a token typically bursts into a harmless, flaring flame that falls to dust in seconds. All Never Tokens are protected by a blue shine magical treatment and all emit a pleasant four-tone metallic chord, like a quartet of bells, when struck. End quote. Now, the magic within the tokens are a secret. There is no way to know them. Identify spells just don't seem to do anything when interacting with one of these tokens. To activate their magics, you have to know what it can do. And then you simply hold the emblem onto any fleshy part of your body, like your hand, and then you will the effect to happen. So what Sundar Silim does is she hands these to her agents, but only tells them the basic effects of each of the tokens, and then tells them more the more she trusts them. Because again, you can only use the powerful magic of the tokens if you know what that magic is. Now, the magical abilities that we know from these tokens are as follows. So, you can cast Dromi's Instant Summons, Featherfall, Invisibility, Mending, Mind Blank, Pass Without Trace, Sending, Silence, and Teleport. Further, it has multiple abilities that are not attached to spells. The first one is called Elsewhere. See, the magic of the token allows Sundar Asylum to essentially store an all-steel item, no larger than a longsword, into an extra-dimensional plane. Uh, the ability elsewhere allows the holder of the token to summon this item, but for only one round before it vanishes back onto the extra-dimensional plane. Uh, no one other than Sundar Asylum knows how to change that safeguarded item. But this ability effectively allows the dragon to say, gift a powerful item onto an agent so that the agent can use it but without risking losing the item. And of course, the agent can't ever really steal the item either because it'll always go back onto that extra dimensional plane. Now, another ability is called Never Return. Now, this allows the agent to teleport the stone onto a predetermined save location where all tokens go if this ability is activated. Uh, currently, the safe house is a secret cavern that runs underneath the Neverwinter Woods. Since there is no known way for the agent to get the token back once this ability is activated, outside of literally like walking towards the safe house, uh, this ability is specifically used for when the agent knows that they are about to die or if they are about to be captured. Uh, this is, of course, to make sure that the token does not fall onto enemy hands. The caveat is that you must sacrifice some of your hit points in order to activate this feature. Uh, then there is the Sovereign Circer ability, the most powerful known ability of the token. So to activate this ability, you must think of another similar token which yours have physically touched at some point in the past. Then the magic essentially calls onto the other one. Whoever is holding on to the other token will feel the call and can choose to either resist it or succumb to it. If they resist it, of course, then nothing happens. But if they succumb to it, uh, they are teleported alongside all of their possessions to your location. So this effect effectively functions as a way to call in reinforcements, allowing you to summon another token wielder onto your location. Interestingly enough, though, the receiver only has like 10 seconds to respond to the call, and the effect fails if they don't accept the call within those 10 seconds. Uh, this is, as you can imagine, quite stressful since you know that if someone is actually activating this ability, it is probably because they need help, which means most likely uh, you're about to be teleported onto lethal danger, but you only have 10 seconds to like grab your weapons and prepare for that danger, or to say no to the call out. And then the last ability is called Trace Never Token, which does what it sounds like. It allows you to know the general direction and distance of the closest Never Token to you. Now, all of these abilities, including the spells, can only be activated once per day each, and only one ability can be active at a time. So if you cast on yourself, say, Mind Blank, with the token, you would have to deactivate it for the rest of the day in order to use any of the token's other abilities. But yeah, based on all of the abilities that these tokens possess, and of course, all of the secret ones that we don't even know about, you can see why I would say that they are basically of legendary level. The amount of things that you can do with these are absurd, and again, these are only the known abilities. Sundar Isilim knows all it can do, but keeps those abilities secret, and she has more than a hundred of these tokens, which is absolutely disgusting. The amount of coordination that one can do thanks to these tokens is unreal, plus, just by having one, you could theoretically summon everyone, right? Person 1 could summon person B, 
who could then summon person C, who could then summon person D, etc, etc. And on top of all that, the, the lore appears to imply that the Steel Dragon knows the location of all of the tokens all the time, or at least she can easily scry upon all the wearers. Many uh, softclaws agents have expressed shock at how it appears that whenever one of them is in grave danger, Sundar Silim just randomly shows up to save them at the last minute. Uh, this is one of the reasons that she is so popular amongst her guild, like a mother who protects her cubs whenever she is needed. Uh, quote, the ambitious dreams pursued by the Laughing Worm, along with her spying on nearby dragons, seems likely to lead her into disaster. Most evil dragons will slay or capture her to gain her long bite secrets if they learn of them. And for Sundarisilim's schemes to come to fruition, she must sooner or later reveal long bite to all dragons. Even if this is somehow accomplished so quickly and widely that one dragon can't gain an advantage over another, the Laughing Worm and her comparatively puny force of soft claws will still be faced with the problem of a dragon or the cult of the dragon in the face of a crush blow to their influence over dragons, moving enthusiastically to try to control most of the easily reached ripple bark. Even hints of a partially successful soft-scale soak would spell the same peril for Sundarisilim. The soft claws know they are in for a dangerous ride in the years ahead, and more than one of them knows what Sundarisilim only suspects. Certain harpers, and probably some of the chosen, know of the Laughing Worm's activities. They might at any time choose to act against her or sweep in to seize what she has crafted. Sundarisilim knows of the increasing danger and seems to sense her remaining time might be short. With increasing daring, she is seeking out passing adventurers to carry her secrets to other places and custodians of lore, notably Candlekeep. Her gamble is a long shot indeed. If she succeeds, however, Faerun will be changed forever, and that's more than many tyrants or gods accomplish." End quote. There are many in this world who seek ways of changing the world for the better, but rarely, very rarely do we ever see someone with a plan and a means of accomplishing it. Further, someone that is so close to achieving it. If dragons needed to not eat humanoids or animals, that would change everything. That could very well be the spark that would allow dragons and humans to live together. But whether she will live long enough to mass produce this miraculous meal, we will have to see. Steel dragons are not known to be particularly strong when compared to other dragons. In fact, they are weaker than the weakest types of dragons within the chromatic and metallic types. Steel dragons are weaker than both the white and the brass dragons. So even though Sundarisilim is an ancient steel dragon, her challenge rating is only 15. This is why she must be protected, and why she takes her disguise and security so seriously, because otherwise, she would be assassinated. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. Remember to click the link in the video description and check out Sands of Doom on Kickstarter, my very own campaign. This has been a dream come true to be able to write a full adventure and I am so excited for you guys to be able to see all of this effort culminate into an amazing experience. Thank you guys so much for all the support that you guys give me. You guys are the best. The link is in the video description. Oh, great Sultana, listen to my counsel. Do not send your men into that ruin. The Anubian treasures have awakened. Their portents of doom whisper their coming. You think yourself the ruler of al -Kirat, but these lands have always been theirs. Their monuments a testament to their might. You will bear the plagues for your sacrilege. The dead will roam the desert and paint the sands crimson. Dust will storm. Rivers will flood. Blood will rain from the very stars. Disease and pestilence 
will cover your grass fields. And soon enough, even the sun will abandon you. Amu will come for you, and your precious little city will fall. You have imprisoned me for this prophecy, but I know something you don't. That is not a tomb. That is a prison. And you will set him free!